It's the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show is sponsored by Cheshire Impact on a mission to help you maximize your use of marketing automation and CRM. CheshireImpact.com. Boom. Now today's guest. Today's guest is an old friend. And we caught up yesterday. It's so exciting. And I got to tell you, all about him. He is what I will call a renaissance man. He is equal parts technology and communications. He is also a practiced, a well-practiced social media rock star. In fact, we actually met at a social media event. And last but not least, he is the host of the Quotable Podcast, one of the fastest growing sales podcasts on the planet. Kevin Michalizzi, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, Casey. What a great intro. Yes. I, I need to hire guy. you to do my intro everywhere I go. <laughs> Should I follow you around and, and like announce you when you come in the room? <laughs> That'd be awesome. You can carry the boom box with my soundtrack as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> the boom box, bring it in. Yeah, here are the, here are the little staff to like bang on the floor and call attention <laughs> to the room. Well, hey, it. man, I'm so glad you could join us today, uh, especially for the theme. It's a new month. And the theme is social media. We were talking about this. It's the CSI. It's that, that roadmap, the success index, maturity model for maximizing marketing automation. And even just your marketing program in general, because you're seeing a lot of people just go ahead and drop some email to a bunch of people without even thinking about who they're sending to. So we have an order to this chaos now. We've talked about identifying your audience, talked about content marketing, reporting. Now we're talking about social media. Social media, integrating it with your whole program tracking it, using technology, having a real conversation. And so what better than you? We met at social. You are social and you, you're a fellow podcaster and you have a great mic, which means your voice is amazing. <laughs> so I got to ask you, you know, let's throw the gauntlet down right up front. Are there any myths around social? Are, are there myths, misconceptions, just bogus strategy? You keep hearing out there and it just triggers you and you just want to like slap people in the face and, and correct them. You know, what are some of the things we can correct right away and just call, call bullshit on? Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that, that totally comes across in, in the conversations I have for the podcast, especially in the sales space, is you don't have to create brand new content to make great use of social. Interesting. Yeah, you don't, because content holds everyone up, right? You wanting to yeah. actually craft it. We spent all last month talking about content strategy, content, content marketing, all sorts of things. There's a lot of, there's a lot of work going on over there. So you don't actually have to write it. Now we're we talking about repurposing others or. You know, the, 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 the best recommendation I've seen is, you know, make sure you're out there, make sure you're, you're obviously, you know, reading up on, on the best in the, the, newest information that's coming out. And when you come across, let's say a blog post that you like, share it, but add your own commentary. And, and, right. you know, obviously I, I work in, in with, with a sales audience and the, the biggest like, thing that I think sales reps forget is, you know, your customer and your space better than the customers do because you talk to so many people about the problems they're they're encountering. So you can add color commentary. Obviously, you know, you're not going to mention that company without permission, but you can add color commentary as you share stuff out. And that helps you, you know, build your image as the expert, you know, helps people see they can rely on you. And you don't have to be a writer. Yeah, you know, it, and I like that. Add your commentary because sometimes I, I, lo I love sharing things, retweeting, LinkedIn, sharing things. But I don't know if I've necessarily added my own commentary to those. That's actually, a, that's a nice, easy win right there. Uh, I'm, I'm sharing someone else's content, but what do you think about it while you're sharing it? That's, a, that's an easy win right there. And the fact so that- I, I want to say before you yeah. go on, oh, yeah, anyone, go anyone who's going to go look up my social media, I am not following my own advice. <laughs> okay. I have a tendency to find a lot of great content and schedule to share it out. I just oh, don't, schedule. I don't always take the time to, to actually add commentary to it. Yeah. And it, but, it's something I'm missing out on. Right. I really should be doing that. Yeah. And I think also to your point, you don't have to always be the one writing the content, literally write. Like if writing is not your thing, do a freaking podcast. And that I was sharing with you the other day that that happened to me. It was, it was December. I was writing up goals for the year and I really wanted to help people 
find an order to the chaos. I wanted to, I want to help people with marketing automation. And I was like, Oh, but man, you know, writing, you know, it's like that. Oh, I'll write a book one that year. Uh, you know, it's the year after that. It's the year after yeah. that. I'll, I'll get to that book. It's, if writing's not your thing or you got some mental hang up from it, do some other kind of medium, you know, like, video like we're doing now but we're also podcasting whatever kind of conversation really they're all conversations they really are and and i think i mean it's kind of funny that we're talking about it i had a, a meeting this morning with a writer i work with and and she and i were talking about that delicate dance you do as a marketer when somebody contributes content and you read it and you know writing's just not the strength and <laughs> you know it it takes, I'm trying to be gentle about it. It takes yeah. a lot of effort to, to really clean it up. So I think you know, if writing is not your strength, then go for the, the one sentence, here's the value add. Um, I'll give uh, Vivica Von Rosen credit. She works uh, at, uh, she's uh, one of the founders of Vengresso. Oh, cool. He works with LinkedIn um, in, in so many different ways. And she and I were talking recently about video and native video coming to LinkedIn. And I, I hadn't really thought about it before, but it's such a great opportunity. You don't need to produce a show. Right. And and I think, right. you, don't get me wrong, Casey, I love the thought of producing a show. Sure. You know, whether you're doing an audio podcast or a video podcast, but you're making a commitment to do it regularly. Yeah. And most people don't have the bandwidth to do it. But if I find a piece of content I like, or let's say I find this episode and I really want to share it maybe I share it on LinkedIn with a quick video of me saying what I like about it and the link to the video. That way I don't, yeah. I don't have to write, but I'm still sharing and adding value as I'm doing it. You know, especially if that communication and that video, if you're animated in your eyes and only so much of that comes out when you're writing. So for me, I mean, I'm yeah. just ah, I'm all over the place. I'm throwing my hands in the air. You, you're shy and quiet. Oh, shy. <laughs> yeah, shy. Just add a you know, Red Bull and vodka to that maybe. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, shy and quiet. But, you know, whatever your strength, right, play to your strength. Right. You know, and if you, have, if you have a face made for radio – then don't do video, you know, do an audio track. But yeah, yeah, that's a really good or, or own it and do video. True. You know, Just do it. own it. We, we are who we are. You know, I mean, we're, we're not fashion models. We're not, you know, uh, icons that, that people are going to look to. Oh, maybe you, for yourself. Maybe, maybe, you, maybe you, Casey, sorry, sorry, yeah. maybe you, but I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm still willing to, to do video and, and really try and get out there. I mean, uh, true confession time, I produce a podcast. I actually hate the sound of my own voice. Always really? have. And I have to sit and edit my own voice. Like I have listened to, gosh, we've produced 86 episodes. I've listened to hours and hours of my voice. I don't like my voice, but, but I'll really? own it because I enjoy the medium and I enjoy the feedback that I'm you getting enjoy from it. Yeah. for it. Interesting. Well, Take it from an expert. You actually have a great voice. So, <laughs> Thanks. A great podcasting voice. But yeah, you know, to your point, hey, own it either way. Create that content. You know, do, talk about what you're passionate about. Right. And, and that'll be, you know, I guess when you do a video or something like that, it, it, the bar is a little higher. You can't hide behind some, some nice writing. You're either excited about it or you're not. Right. Uh, but to your, to your but point too, do what you have time for. You know, do I have time for this or time for that? Maybe right. A quick little share. Um, of some information that I found or something I'm excited about, share it on LinkedIn. But there's no rule that says they have to come with the Casey Cheshire level energy. You know, you can, you can make true. a video and be like, so I came across this great article. Or Here, Casey Cheshire did this awesome podcast. And, you know, they talked about, and you fill in a couple topics. I thought it was a great conversation. You should really listen to it. I've included the link. You don't have to like bring that. the like driving True. Casey True. energy. Ah. You bring yourself. <laughs> you right. Know, everyone comes in, in different flavors, different styles, and be authentic. I mean, I think yeah. that, that's something you and I haven't talked about yet, uh, that we talked about yesterday. Uh, being authentic has to be a part of everything you do on social. Everything. Everything from the tweet to the video to the, you know, I think. You're right. The authenticity. People can smell when you're not being true to yourself. First of yeah. all, it sucks. And your body knows it, yeah. right? Your soul knows. You're like, I'm doing something. This is horrible. 
Um, and so that, and then that sort of, you can't hide that. You can't poker face that away. That just comes out. Right. Who's this, who's this jerk over here? He's telling me to do this and he's not even excited or not even excited about it, but he doesn't even believe what he's saying or she's yeah. saying. Yeah, so I have, just, I have, oh, go ahead. No, no, I like that. So how, how do you ensure that that stays in there, right? How do you stay focused or not get distracted? You want to, I mean, how do you even know if you're being authentic? Well, I mean, I, 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 for me, it's always a gut feel. Sure. You know, I, I, the way I think about it is, you know, if, if it's not something I believe in, then I'm not going to post on social media and be like, I think this is amazing. You know, if you and I wouldn't sit down across from each other and, and, you know, I'd say, Casey, I really like what you're doing. Like, if I wouldn't tell you that, then I'm not going to go and, you know, publish something to say, I think that was amazing. I, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, does this podcast make me look fat? Like, you, you, <laughs> right. you, have, you have the situations where you want to be polite. Sure. Um, I think that one of the best rules I've seen, and, and we can talk more about this, um, when it comes to like a corporation's employees sharing stuff out, if you feel the need to vent or complain, the, the best rule I think I've ever seen on this is make sure you're talking about a specific scenario. So if something bad happened, talk about that. Don't don't just right. badmouth the company in general. Right. Like really focus it and be specific if if you feel the need to vent. Right. But but I think for me it's 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 really the 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 authenticity. Like if I don't believe it, I don't say it. Right. Well, no. Back to your earlier point. You know, any idiot can say this this brand sucks. You know. Right. Uh, first of all, no one wants to see that. And right. then second of all, that brand can't fix anything. Yep. <laughs> it can't help you. Um, yep. So, I, I, you know, it's interesting. I remember I, I, love, I love some of my brands. I mean, I love Delta and Hilton when I do some traveling. I kind of got it all figured out so I don't have to, you know, go off the reservation. You know, I like that consistency. Right. But, but hey, every now and then we're all human. Something happens. And I'll tweet at so-and-so and just say, hey, you know, this situation has happened here at this airport. Um, this is what's happened. It, and ideally it's, it's for help. But even if you're going to rant to your point, it, make it very specific. So ideally they're learning from it, you know? Yeah. And uh, they're able definitely. To that. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, I think we're all going to reach a point where we feel the need to vent online. Sure. You know, if, if you're at the airport and you've already done the customer service desk, you're not getting any help. Things are ugly. I had a friend recently fly. I won't mention the airline cause it's, it's actually an airline I love. Um, she actually asked at the desk because her flight was delayed. She said, are there any other flights to Portland? And she was said, she was told no. And then 40 minutes later, final boarding call for a flight to Portland run by that airline. Her flight is now four hours delayed. Oh no. So, you know, of course, in those kind of scenarios, you're not getting the help you need. Right. Social media can be a good tool for, for kind of upping your message and maybe getting someone else's attention who can help you. But again, you're, you're on a specific scenario. Right. You know, I think you, you undermine your own credibility when you just badmouth someone in general. Because, right. you know, it's, it's, a, it's like if I was going to give you feedback, I, I need to tell you exactly what it is I'm giving you feedback on, positive or negative, because otherwise you, you either can't continue or repeat what you've done or you can't fix it. Right. For sure. And, you know, airlines in particular are really good at, you know, it's, I, I guess I sometimes with, with airlines that travel, I'll do the whole trust, but verify. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's no more flights. Cool. Let me go call the number while I'm checking my, my phone, just confirming. Uh, but you know, I had a, something happen to me with Hertz and it was in Chicago. And I, I always do those guys too. I was on the, the shuttle back to the airport and I needed to go to like B concourse and the guy dropped me off at like D, but he swore up and down that it was also B. Oh, right. No. And, and it was like, it was that, that was the weird part. It was like, maybe you messed up. We'll go around again. Cool. I, whatever. I'll sit in the, but the fact he's like, no, 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 you're good. This is all. And I don't know. And I, I don't go to O'Hare a lot. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, B connects with, D, C somehow. Right. It, it was like a gigantic walk. And it wasn't so much the walk 
you know, I got, I got my steps in, caught some Pokemon on the way. It was more <laughs> the fact that I, I think the guy lied to me. And so, you know, I tried calling, couldn't get through. So eventually I went to, to social and you know, I'm always cognizant of the fact that, you know, especially on Twitter, people are, can read that, you know? Yep. So yep. do, do you, do you want to be the person where they're hearing your worst complaint phone call? You know, right. I'm always thinking about, well, at least on Twitter, they definitely can see you. Um, in this uh, n- nearby office I have here, I- I've heard someone on, on a phone talking to customer service. Now it comes through the walls when they're really mad, but the guy's yelling crazy. And it's like, it's like, you don't, you don't want people to hear that. Well, on Twitter, they're seeing it, you know? And right. so I was, I was just very, I was mad, but I, I tweeted the specific situation and how uncool it was to Hertz. And they were responding. They were very quick to respond. I mean, there's nothing they can do. They can say sorry a couple times. And sometimes just that's, that's, a, that, that's all you're going to get. But at least you got, you were heard, you know? Right. But, but I think the companies that are really doing well with social actually do something with that knowledge. Mm. You know, so even if they right, don't so, directly yeah. control the shuttle that did it, they can say, okay, it's O'Hare, let's let that office know. So at least, right. you know, hopefully something is set in motion by, you know, your feedback to them. Right. You know, and, and that reminds me, the flip side of that, there's actually, there's a big, there's a story around JetBlue. There was a, there was a passenger that basically had this love affair with JetBlue. I don't know if you've heard of this. Yeah, I don't think um, I've heard this one. Yeah, I'll have to Google this. Um, but he basically uh, it was in started in Boston, our whole old you know haunting grounds. Right. And he was getting on a flight in Boston, and he didn't have time to go to Starbucks, and so he got on the flight and he tweeted to JetBlue, "Hey JetBlue, um, here I am in seat 34B. Do I have time to get a Starbucks or something?" And uh, they I don't know they tweeted back or something, but they one of the the airport operations manager saw the tweet and got him specific coffee and delivered oh, now that's very you know, cool like, so-and-so uh, actually didn't know the seat uh mr so-and-so could you bring your flight bell and they delivered the coffee and that started this crazy let's see here love affair <laughs> the jet blue uh, it started this crazy adventure and what this guy would do Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, Paul Gordon Brown. Shout out to him. He has this really wow. good talk. You should look up on, uh, it's on YouTube, eight minutes and 45 seconds, uh, where he, he goes from that. And now that now he's in, now he's, he's got a crush. And so he starts tweeting at them when things go right. And then got to the point where he would lay out his outfit the morning of a, a travel and he'd say, which shirt should I wear? <laughs> the, the white one or like the beige one? And Jet Blue would be like, the white one, you know, and they went back and forth, back and forth. And they held these cute things. And on Valentine's day, he wrote a haiku poem of love. Oh my gosh. And in, in response, they created a badge. I think it was on, Oh, on the JetBlue app. I, I don't okay. use it a lot, but when you travel to certain cities, you get a, a, a pin for that city. They made a particular badge that only he would get, which was like this. I love JetBlue. We love you back. Um, jet blue heart thing just for him that's phenomenal. just for his app you know and it was this give and take and obviously you know other things are going on for jet blue around that but that's just right. little little tiny moments to make people's day you know but if you think about it how many people tweet i had a great flight <laughs> right <laughs> yeah, it, it just, <laughs> people do it on the extremes like yeah. wow that was the most amazing experience ever i've got to tell people about it or Something went wrong. I need to vent about it. And, right. you know, I would say it's maybe 80, 20, 20% are the, wow, that was exceptional. I'm so excited. I'm going to tell the world versus the 80% who are like, oh, this line was really long. You know, it, it could yeah. be anything, you know, and, and flying is a tough thing. So, you know, that, it's stressful true. for a lot of people. So, it's, it, but it, any of those situations, like I think JetBlue handled that really well. Yeah. Um, kind of rough if you set that kind of an expectation. I don't know how many people tweeted after that going, you know, I would like a double caramel <laughs> macchiato. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in seat 18 B. I tried it <laughs> naturally. <laughs> so, but not, not for JetBlue. I didn't want to cheat on my airline. So I, <laughs> it was actually a presentation um, VP of marketing JetBlue presented this. So I was like, I wanted to put my love to the test. So I tweeted at Delta and at JetBlue at the same time. It was like, you know, thank you, JetBlue, for your presentation. 
you know, my heart is still with Delta or something. Try to see uh, who's going to respond first. Like, don't, you know, don't let JetBlue beat them and prove me wrong. But you now Delta wrote back and they're like, thank you. You know, we care about you too. Um, you know, not to the JetBlue level, but they at least responded first. So I felt, I felt okay with that. And I haven't asked them to pick out my clothes yet. So, <laughs> you know, I think in, in all the years we've been doing this, Casey, like I think we're at the point where a lot of companies obviously do watch social media, especially Twitter. Right. Um, you, you, we're at the point now where I can talk to brands on Facebook. Um, my understanding is the latest uh, app update from or the OS update from Apple will allow me to actually use the Apple messaging to talk to brands. I oh, haven't wow. haven't had a chance to explore it yet, but but I think brands have have they've gotten better at it. You know, they 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 understand. But now one of the problems I see and and you know, I'm I'm sure this probably happens in your world. Um I know the the folks at McKinsey like Jennifer Stanley talk about this a lot and and that is you know, the customers I I I don't want to I don't want to put words in Jennifer's mouth. So I'm going to split what I'm saying hey, what's here. What's up Jennifer? Shout out. Yeah, no, I, Jennifer's awesome. Um I, I, I'm, I'm going to split, I'm, I'm going to split this up because <laughs> I, I think, you know, my, my color commentary on this one is we've been spoiled by B2C experiences. So mm. our consumer like experience, Jeff, yeah, like those, like, yeah. the fact that I can check into my hotel on a phone, I can check in for my flight on the phone. Like right. I think from a, uh, experience perspective we, we're getting spoiled and <laughs> i love it i hope it continues i hope it expands totally. but when you're looking at b2b sales and and the entire customer experience people are coming to it with that expectation and i know mckinsey and jennifer have done a lot of research around this and and the fact that you know with this move to digital people expect you to be on every channel as a company and they expect you to know, you know, I know who Casey is, whether Casey's coming in by a text message, right. by a, you know, a Facebook chat message, whether, you know, it's phone call, email, you've got to be ready for them in every respect as, as a company. And, and it's got to be seamless. You know, it's just like the customer doesn't care how you structure your company. They don't care how your systems work. They just care that the minute you you make that connection with them that you know who they are. That's you know, you, you're not making that sales call. You know, you don't have somebody um, making a sales call at the same time, like they're having a huge customer support issue. You know, it's, it's you know, the, the right hand talking to the left kind of scenario. Like social media is the same way. You've got to know who that person is regardless of how they talk to you. You know, that's a, that's a really, it's cool that it's moving that way. Uh, it's definitely not solved yet. The tools are there. Um, we do a lot of work with Salesforce, CRM, and th it's, you're able to do that in the tool, but you got to build it. You got to do it. And then you got to have the discipline to set it all up and make sure left hand's talking the right hand and all of that. Um, I was once working with a company, and it was probably a year and a half ago, and they had an issue because they had so acquired so many different companies and they hadn't consolidated their picture that right. someone bought this million dollar is literally, I usually, I usually exaggerate, but this was about a million dollars worth of medical um, machinery. Mm -hmm. And the very next day, the person who had been the one, you know, the, the signer and really the internal champion to get that done, got calls from no kidding two sales reps from other parts of that company, treating them like they'd never heard of the company before. Oh, gosh. You know? <laughs> it, like, that's the opposite of that picture. But you're right. Now that we've had those experiences on, on the B2C side, B2B is saying, look, I, I, treat me the same way. Yep. And you know, it's interesting. There's a little bit of a, a give and take here, especially lately. Because um, one of the things I was thinking about, people want to, uh, you, I need you to know who I am across channels. Mm -hmm. but I also want to keep my privacy, right? I want to, yeah, yeah. I call Delta and it knows, hello. And it says your ex excellency. He doesn't say that, but it knows who I am and it says my name and, uh, and it's cool. And I don't have to type in some stupid number anymore uh, for them to know that. But what about online? I, I'll, you know, in, in the different, you know, knowing who you are here and there, right? Facebook, I mean, they were just in 
they just you know presented to Congress right. about privacy. You know, so it's it's interesting. Uh, as marketers, we're kind of uh, yeah, we everyone's tracking everything everywhere, but I don't think that's that's is known as much as as it is, especially on something where maybe you were trusting it initially on Facebook. Man, it's an ad platform <laughs> with pictures. Yeah. You know? It's social sorta, but really it's so that we can, you know, generate ads. Um, how do you, what do you think about that balance between, you know, we want privacy, but we want, we want that, that white glove service, know who we are and, and treat us that 360 degree view of the person, you know, how do you, can, can, can those ever be okay with each other or are they always going to probably pull in different directions? Yeah, that is a great question. I, I think I think consent is the most important thing. Cool. And and I think the this is my my personal opinion does not I, I don't I don't speak for anyone else on it. <laughs> but when it when, no when it comes to yeah, Facebook, sure. I think what irritates me the most about it is I, I feel like one you, I really don't have say and and I did get the notification that my data was shared. Yeah, me too. Um I I I am I'm also somewhat careful about what I put on there. Right. So, you know, I mean it's not like they have my credit card info or anything like that. Right. But at the same time, you know, you you go through the privacy agreement and the license agreement and none of us read the entire thing. And, yeah, right. you know, I I hate to say it, like I will I will read it and I'll work with the legal team if, if it's something professional that I'm, I'm paying right. for or buying. But like social media, I just, I, I'm horrible about it. Like I'll be the first to admit and, and I'm pretty sure, you know, most people don't read the manuals for things. Most people don't read the, the end user license agreement. They don't read the privacy statement. They don't read any of it. But I think, and, and I don't know what the answer is, but I think there has to be a way for you to very clearly give consent to yeah. what is being shared. Like, I like the fact that, you know, HIPAA protects medical information. So if I am working with a doctor and I want another doctor to share that info, I have to give explicit permission, uh, explicit permission yeah. for that data to be given to another doctor. I work with both doctors, but that data is private and I have to approve the transfer. We don't have any of those kind of protections I, I'm here in the U.S. Right. I, I mean, I think they're, they're definitely coming in other parts of the world. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to land here. I, I think people are really concerned about it. I, I'm concerned about it. You know, when when you can have that much influence on anything, whether it's yeah. a political process it's or the political or, side, yeah, yeah, or whatever it is. You know, notice I'm, I'm dancing lightly here. <laughs> this is not a political show, but uh, no, right. I think I think that I don't know the answer, but I think I know I know the problem in my mind is consent. I don't I didn't get the opportunity to give consent to what was shared. Right, and they would argue that you know in the 32 pages on the HTML scroll bar that they explicitly detailed you know 32 pages worth of privacy notifications. It's like the jokes up everyone knows that no one reads that you just you wrote so much legalese that no one exactly you, but and, and it's the legalese so much legalese that no one's going to read it yep. so i wonder if what what is coming or should be coming is something where you know almost like a cigarette pack you know and when you said <laughs> where it just says a single sentence and it says you know do this at your own risk or this can be bad you know see um, I, I don't know no? if i agree with you casey no I don't think I do because having a warning on there doesn't change the fact that there are many levels of what could be shared. That's true. Like, yeah, do I don't know if I mean yeah, warning as much as like uh, the you know when the, cons the when you said consent, I thought of Apple and I thought of uh, Steve Jobs had actually had a rant ab about Facebook and about these sites like moons ago, uh, saying, "Hey, look on Apple, it's very clear." If, if, if we're about to share your location, you know, or this or that, it's going to say, do you want to share this? Yep. You have to say, yes, you know, yep. like to your point, that consent is very clear. Um, and, you know, I guess there is that sort of message on Facebook too, but maybe we just take it for granted or, or that's, that's with a third party, but we didn't really have that message internally. I don't know. Well, see, that's the thing. The notice that I got was I did not download an app that shared my information. 
one of the people that I'm friends with downloaded the app and shared my information. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it was There's like no consent to that. It was like yeah. hometown, but I think it included birthday. I, I'm pretty sure there were a couple things in there. You know, like I, again, not not something someone could necessarily use for identity theft or right. anything like that. But at the same time, I w- I want to have a say in the matter. Yeah, it's a principle too. Yeah, yeah, totally. Interesting, Interesting man. You know, I I, I guess it kind of ties into the idea that. You know, sometimes companies aren't really thinking through the entire experience. You know, we, oh, we yeah. kind of siloed into act, this action or this action, but we're not thinking about. You know, and I guess this is more on that B two B side of, you know, what happens when you first enter, and then what happens next, and the next, and next. But really, taking a few minutes, I think a lot of us just shoot from the hip in marketing and in business. But really, taking just a one step second step back and plan out that whole process from start to finish, or what you think it is, at least version one of it. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. And you and I actually talked about this for a few minutes yesterday. Yeah. The fact that people find a tool and they say, okay, you know, I've got a marketing automation tool. I'm going to do an email send. They don't think about that right. entire customer journey and the fact that, well, you know, I could be really using this, you know, I could be using this really effectively if I figured out, okay, from the moment I meet Casey, what does Casey's journey look like? Right. You know, what can I provide in that process to help him understand the challenges he's got, uh, understand possible ways to fix it? You know, even like before you get to talking about products and features, like yeah. what can I do to make this journey easier? A lot of people don't think the whole, they don't think I love, I love, I'm, I'm like all or I'm yeah. like wiping my screen in this conversation. The Italian hands for it. Oh, totally, listening totally. to this. Yeah. Their hands are all over the place for both me and Kevin. We're just going crazy. Over yeah, here. Being like, a, being a podcaster has, has yeah. really um, spoiled <laughs> me in that, uh, you know, I had learned to, to not do the hand gestures all the time. And, and now that I do the podcast, you know, I sit here and I'm, I'm talking away cause nobody could see me. Oh, you don't, um, you don't do video on yours. I do not. I do oh. audio only. Yeah, you know, it's like that rare inside inside look. So if people actually want to see our hands flapping around, they can go to YouTube and see it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, a lot I of most it. people are in the car somewhere. Right? Those hands just be distracting. They're like, who is this idiot over here riding shotgun, flapping his hands all over the place? <laughs> totally. It's crazy. Totally, but yeah, I think most people don't think about the entire picture. They only think about, okay, I found this tool. And right. what is my current need? What do I need to accomplish? And they just do that. So I, I think, you know, in the same way that most companies don't think about that omni-channel approach, yep. so that when a customer comes in, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous. They don't care where the customer comes in. They just know who the customer is. It, it's the same thing with the tools, too. People just yeah. don't. They haven't thought out the big picture. And, and we won't even get into the fact that, you know, a lot of people structure their process around what's convenient for the company, yeah. not what the buyer's experience looks like. Right, right. Or the end result. You yeah. know, I think there's a lot of people talking about, you know, tracking everything to revenue now, you know, track it all the way through to revenue. And at least it's a start. I, one of the things I found too is that the tech side, I'm guilty of this. Back in the day, there was a tool, I think it was Clickable. And this was probably- I remember that. Remember, you remember Clickable? I do. You, you could basically plug it in for everyone else. You could plug it into your AdWords. And, and at least the sales demo basically promised that with the, the you know, IQ, with the acuity of a kindergartner, you could then create the most optimized PPC campaigns ever. Right. With it. And there were these really cool, I mean, I'm a sucker for graphics. There was these really cool, like almost like stock ticker, ticker graphics, arrows, orange arrows up or net neutral, green, it's on the rise, red down. Like, oh, this is so cool. It's going to optimize. And um, it was a little more work than that. We ended, up hiring, <laughs> we ended up hiring the sales guy who sold us Clickable to consult with us Wow! Outside, outside of work, to actually do our PPC for us because he was a you know a wizard at it. That's shout out to right. Sean. But um, yeah, yeah. So it it's that that um, we want to make a problem go away by buying a tool. You yep. know, almost, I guess it's it's almost like pervasive in society. Even make make a problem go away by buying a pill or oh gosh, yes, the, the quick fix something. And so 
But oftentimes in marketing, it's that technology. I'm going to float a theory here. So it's, it's the, I'll call it the Facebook social media effect. You and I and, and other folks, like we're on Facebook, we're connected to folks. We're connected to folks that we probably thought we would never reconnect with. Sure. You know, from all the way back to elementary school. And I find it fascinating because a lot of the folks that I know watch Facebook and Instagram and, you know, maybe not Twitter so much or LinkedIn, but they watch it religiously to see the lives of the people they know or knew. Yeah. And, and so they almost live vicariously through that. Right. So, you know, the, the grass is always greener. Yeah. It's, yeah, it, it'll always be that way. And, and I'm sorry, like I've had people say, Kevin, you lead, lead such an amazing life. Like I look at your Instagram. No, I don't. I lead a boring life. But occasionally I get a good picture and I share it on social media. Right. And, but that's <laughs> all you remember. Like people forget that you're not seeing Casey Cheshire's entire life. You're right. seeing a moment in time that happened to be a good moment or, or whatever right. it was. And, and I think businesses do the same thing. It takes more work to make something look easy than it does to just do it. Yeah. You know, the people who are true pros, whether it's individuals or companies, they make it look easy. But it takes a lot of work to get to that level. And I think people think, like, I'm just going to plug a tool in here and I'm going to fix this. And, and they're not really sucking it up, pulling up the bootstraps and saying, yeah. like, what do I need to do? You know, they're, they're doing that same kind of, well, you know, I mean, all these companies, you know, these big, big name companies bought this product. If, if I right. buy it, I'm going to be just like them. It, right. it, it doesn't work that way. You've got to get... says I should buy this thing. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that because right. Gardner does some freaking amazing research. You might, might actually need that tool, but you, it's, it's how you use it, you know? Um, totally. To your point, no one shares boring Instagram photos, but wouldn't that be a cool hashtag? Like we should just create that now and you do one, I'll do one. And like the most boring photo um, that, that it's the most unimpressive, boring photo to share on Instagram that no one ever, like real life, you know? Oh, uh, okay. Hashtag you know? real life and just, yeah. you know, post my bowl of cereal in the morning and... Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah like with a couple of Cheerios still floating in there and... Pulling out the trash bins to the curb last night. Yeah, you know, it's overcast. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah I miss suns. I miss sunset, so it's just dark. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, have you seen that? Because this is this whole point is so true. There's um, there's something. The people that share on Instagram or Etsy, they do they some amazing thing. There's this. There's I don't know what the hashtag is, but people. It's like in real life that okay. people will take some Etsy creation or some Instagram creation and they'll try to redo it. And, and it oh, looks, so like taking a, a like a professional image and trying yeah. to recreate it. Okay, I think there's That's actually a show on Netflix for that too now, where they have some amazing baking, and they're like, okay, we have three regular baking people. Oh, who they try and imitate it? Like, and they try to imitate it, and you know, it never look, right? It never looks like that amazing creation, you know, that, that the people were sharing on online. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's the same premise for for businesses. You you can't just look at a tool and say, that tool's going to solve all my problems. Right. You know, I'm, I've been in the industry, uh, high tech industry since 94. No tool solves all your problems. You've got to know what problem you're trying to solve. Yep. You've got to know what that big picture looks like and then figure out what tools can help me do that. And then even with the tools, how many people do you work with, Casey, who buy marketing automation and they really have no picture of what they need to do with it? Yeah, absolutely. It's probably most of them, right? Well, for a lot of people, unless they're coming from some other tool, it's like it's it's not just you know an, another tool. It's like a different way of doing marketing is what this right. brings in. It ushers in a whole new way of doing things. So it's right. it's kind of a a gut check for people and they're like, oh, I'm just going to send an email on this thing now. It's like, no, no, no. This is a this is an amazing change in how you're going to do everything. So you know, oftentimes I uh, we we trying to figure out what shape this should be, but we've realized that. Um, it really is like you need to nail the strategy of what you should be doing. And then you nail the process. It's like, when, when is all that happening? And then you nail the technology. So we've always said like, right. at Chesh, strategy, process, technology. Yep. Technology, it's important. It's part of it. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's like being handed the absolute best craftsman tools from Home Depot and, and the beautiful wood and cedar and yep. nice lumber. And they're like, go ahead, build. They don't even say build something. They don't even say what to build. They just say build. You know, it's not even like your IKEA instruction set. You it's know, it's not even <laughs> IKEA, which is hard onto itself. Like, but it, it says okay, build. You know, it's like a bunch of Legos. Build oh, Legos would be more fun, but with the craftsman tools, it's like holy moly. Now, right. if it said build a doghouse, here's a plan. Or even if they told you, to your point, what you're building. You know, you you mentioned earlier, you got to know what your goal is, right? Before you can build to it. Yeah, no, I like I like how you're approaching it the, the the strategy, the process, and then the technology. Because if you don't do that, then you could throw all the technology in the world at what you're doing. Doesn't mean you're doing the right things or you're doing them well. Totally with you. Well, yeah. well played, Casey. Well New played. New Hampshire for the win. I <laughs> represent. <laughs> so it it's been a. I mean, we were talking about this earlier. How long has it been since you were over here? Because we first met uh, in New Hampshire, right? Well, I've gone back to visit a few times, but it's been five, five and a half years since I moved yeah, time flies, uh, to the West man. Coast. Jeez, time yeah. flies. But, you know, I, I love to get to, you know, first probably we should just chat about um, how we met because it's really relevant to this. And then from that, I love to hear kind of your background because for everyone listening, this is really cool for me too because normally when we're chatting, we've, we've got beers and we're talking about, I don't know, the latest Nashua, New Hampshire news, right? Yep. So, so it's yep. great to actually take these conversations that much further and really dive into them and hash them out and, and all that. But we met at, um, it was a tweet up, I think we were saying. I was going to say, I'm, I'm looking it up because I used to be really, really good at keeping notes of where I met people. And uh, Where do you keep those? Do you put them on LinkedIn or what do you? Do no, you they're, they're totally in, in my address book, notes. I've been huh. doing this for gosh, fifteen years. See, I I I told everyone you're a rock star, and this this is an <laughs> example of that. I I, I don't even do that. I gotta admit, I've I've become lazy about it in recent. Sure. Years. So I panic periodically, and I go, oh, let me go back and like fill in details because <laughs> because like seriously, you reached out about the the uh, podcast interview, and I was like, you know, I swear I've known Casey for probably ten years, but like I couldn't remember. Feels and like so it, right? I looked it up. We met. Uh, uh, December 10th. No way. You have this data? 2009 right, in Nashua, right. New Hampshire at Killarney's Pub <laughs> at a tweet up that you coordinated. Yeah, Nashua tweet up. Back in the totally. day. Totally. That's amazing. You have even the date and the location. I remember that at uh, Killarney's. That was quite, it's this little. It was, it was, it was the this first week. time we met. It's a little hole in the wall pub at a Holiday Inn. And yes. ba back in yes. the day, it was, it was actually kind of a cool motif. It was like this Irish bar, Killarney's. And they used to have this old wood in the bar. So you're in a Holiday Inn. It's super yep. sterile and it, you know, it's a hotel. But then you walk in this pub door and there's this old, would it's like you're walking into an old irish pub you know and then there's karaoke but uh <laughs> yep. that, yeah that was a that was a cool but that was time, interesting man. because i think i obviously you know 2009 social media was it was early enough yeah. that it alone warranted bringing groups of professionals together so like boston i know there were, there were a lot of boston tweet oh, yeah you know, uh, Nashua tweet ups, New Hampshire tweet up, social media breakfast, New Hampshire. There were there were so many yeah. you know, gatherings just to talk about social media because it was still new. Now I think it's so pervasive that you know I'd be like, Casey, do you want to come have a tweet up? You'd be like, about what? You know, it wouldn't be like, well, let's go. Do you think like do you think it would work or or no? I, I don't. I don't. Was know. it kind of magical? Were we kind of like it was so? It wasn't super new. I mean, I was. I think I was user number fourteen million on Twitter, but now there's like bajillion of them. But do you right. think it would work now? Or was it like the the heyday? Of I think social? we were still we Innocence? were still on the cusp of companies learning how to leverage it and leverage it well. I, I, I still, I think that was early enough. I mean, obviously it wasn't, you know, the, the beginning. It wasn't yeah. like we were the meetup of the first hundred users. You yeah. know, I, I can't claim that on any of the platforms, but, but I think it was still early enough and new enough for folks as a business tool that people really wanted to come together and talk about it and, and learn more about it. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think about some of the topics that we talk about back then and, and I'm just like, wow, like I couldn't imagine going to an event like that anymore. Yeah, you know, I, I would totally go to something that was coordinated on social media. Yeah. But it would have to have some kind of a topic. Like for me, social you media think is it not would? enough. Because you're right. It, it, they didn't really have a topic. It was like, hey, you're on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. We're going to this bar. See you there. Yeah. You know, r- rando Twitter person. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was before, before people were using like Twitter and Facebook for flash mobs. Yeah. Consistently and, and things like that. So it was new and novel to say, well, you know, I put this up, uh, you know, put up this invite on social media or uh, let's say on Twitter and, you know, 50 people showed up for it. And, you know, I mean, I would, I would totally, just to be clear on this, I would totally do one if I was back in the Nashua, New Hampshire area, if you were coordinating it just for nostalgia's nice. sake. Be a good experiment. But, you know, <laughs> three of us show up, we're like, well, that's an interesting result. All right, let's drink. Well, if everyone's listening, just uh, not, go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. No, I was I was, it's just not novel enough to warrant it. So what were you saying? I was just saying, just describing this this thing that we did, it was a Nashua tweet up. It was a city, and we would just start hitting people. And what I, one of the things I did is I would just went to Twitter search and looked for Nashua, New Hampshire. Yeah. And I would just tweet at random people and say, hey, we're getting together. And then I'd talk to a local bar or restaurant and say, I'm going to have 20 people show up. Can you give us a drink special, maybe a free app or something? And they were like, sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then eventually that get more and more. And we had a registration page and all that. And, and you know, what's funny is, is uh, we met some of the best people at that. Oh, totally. We really did. Totally. Some of the best people were the ones that were like, yeah, Twitter. I mean, even some family friends now. We all met them from there. Yeah. And now they're I, babysitting I, our kids, I right? Touch of, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I keep in touch with, I, I would say it, probably half the people I met at those events. Sure. And it's 10 years later. Sure. There's something good about that. I, that, that I and mean, that's why part of me hopes that that kind of thing could happen again. I think, you know, actually it stopped happening, which is why I stopped doing it. Um, because the more people you told the bar you're going to have, the more goodies you got. But then the more people you had to have actually show up. Yep. And we would, at some point, I think we did it for like two years, but at some point, whenever a year started to decline, we'd have way less people show up. And right. Right. it was almost like that was even, it was like experiencing social changing in a way. Like that infancy was transitioning. Maybe we were toddlers at that point, but now we were big kids and elementary school and it wasn't cool anymore i don't know, something but it did change a little bit but for a while it was just randomly showing up and meeting people and it was like a networking event right you know all based on this one social platform i, I love how you you've made this into a maturity model i <laughs> pers- i personally think it was is a shiny object syndrome so the the luster and shine of you know going to some get together because people talked about it on Twitter. I think that wore off over time. Yeah. I mean, I think PodCamp, uh, Social Media Breakfast, New Hampshire, those, some of those lasted longer because they were topical. You know, people were coming together to, so someone could present. For a topic. Yeah. Yeah. On a particular topic, but it wasn't just like a, uh, you know, a a Wednesday night happy hour. Right. Hashtag attached to it. Yeah, people wanted more of that deliberateness of, let's go for something particular. Yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. a good that's a good point. I suppose if we had made it more particular, because it really was just very generic, like show up, meet other people that are cool, you know, <laughs> and drink. It totally and, was and free apps. There was like no pur- purpose it totally to it other was. than. But we got some giveaways at one point, and it, but it was interesting. But yeah, it was it was more a more matter of uh, it was. The shiny, the shiny. I, I I like that. You know what? I wonder if you could repeat that. Like, have a Nashua Instagram. <laughs> Just everyone. <laughs> we're all hey. we're all suckers on some level for the shiny objects. The shiny new thing. We really yeah. are. You know, it's it's new. It's novel. Let's check it out. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you know, I I have a question. So um, you know, our conversations that we were mentioning earlier, we're talking about you know surface level stuff, general networking with strangers from Twitter. Uh, now we're getting into more of the deep of the strategy of marketing. Um, and I've had a chance to, you know, 
at least, you know, in person, you know, know you and, and you're a really cool dude. But what I don't know much about <laughs> is that history of like, who are you, you know, <laughs> other than what I see on LinkedIn or any of that kind right. of thing. You know, yeah, so a lot how, much, of times how, much, how much time we got? <laughs> well, man, we got, we got all day, man. Uh, I'll, I'll sit down on this couch and just I'll just listen. And uh, but yeah, you know, like how did how did how <laughs> Kevin Mick, the ad sign Kevin Mick, come come to be? You know, you know, I I, I got to admit that comes from my geek side and yeah. and the early day geek geekiness. That was actually the username for my login at my first high tech job. Really. And, it was just uh, K E V I N M I C, so you know, first name, first three letters of my last name. I loved it, and I was like, you know what, that works. That totally works. However, on some of the newer services, now that I'm not like on top of everything that's created, I don't usually get that anymore. Really? Because there are other, especially younger folks, who snatch it up on Instagram, Snapchat. Actually, I think I got Instagram, but. Um, you know, it's just yeah, like next generation is ahead of me now. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like the four year old faster. telling me how to use yeah. my iPad. So <laughs> oh, man, they're good, man. Like uh, no three kidding. year old, and they're shrinking and zooming and, and no uh, kidding. It's because there's I, in my mind there's no fear. Yeah, like we all have preconceived notions when we look at it, and little ones. Pff, they're just like, woo, touch, 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 touch. Oh, yeah. it did something. Let me do that again, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Then they realize there's Netflix hiding behind that. Yep. Or some cool game. They're like, get me in there. Yep, totally. And that's why dad puts a password on it. So you gotta, <laughs> and, I don't, and they don't know what it is. But every now and then, I got to be careful. I have to like hide the thing because my daughter, she got these eagle eyes. She's watching. She's watching. Right? If she can, if she can, she, she knows the first number is one, you know? Yep. <laughs> so it's like, he's the first number one. I'm like, I'm not telling you, <laughs> uh, but yeah, a little bit of that. So yeah. So, okay. So it. username, first three letters. Yeah. Early tech job. Did you yeah. So, for- so uh, honestly, yeah. like I went to school, like for college, yeah. I studied interpersonal communication. So I got a degree okay. in speech com. I was dead set. You know, this was, you know, I'm going to date myself here. Like I graduated college in 94 and I was dead set. I was not going into computers. That was what my dad did. That was just (laughs) not interested. Like wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I ended up falling into tech, uh, doing tech supports uh, for PowerSoft Corporation back in 94, bought by Sybase. So I, Pretty much started on the geek side of the house. Loved every minute of it, but I, I will be candid. I'm I'm not the best programmer, so yeah. <laughs> really, very quickly they're like, Kevin, you're on you're you're on uh, marketing now. Uh, <laughs> no, I you know I lucked out in that I managed to fall within a year in of being in uh, in tech. I managed to fall into a uh, internet related role. Yeah, doing you know um, digital customer support. So it was super new, like most companies hadn't figured out how to tackle it. And then managed to, uh, like our webmaster, that's what you called it back then, <laughs> yeah, our I webmaster took off after a new opportunity. So I ended up picking up not only doing programming, but system admin, that kind of stuff, which was cool. Like I geeked out on it. Yeah. Um, I think what was missing was the the real communication and, you know, tackling people challenges at the same time. So yeah. so around 2000, I moved over to the management track and started managing engineering teams. So I owned web engineering, web operations, and then ultimately web marketing as well. So it all started to kind of come full circle uh, when I joined a startup called DimDim that was focused on web conferencing. And I was doing, you know, electronic marketing, community management, social media, and, and really starting to get into that space. So since then, I've really been on back on, I should say back on the man, uh, marketing track yeah. um, because it, it really uses my background. But it's, it's awesome, I would say, having the technology foundation because I, I, like I come across stuff where people are like, oh my gosh, that's so complicated. And it's like, well, okay, you know, that one's, actually not that bad sure. you know you're you're not writing the code for it you're just right. plugging in some things but uh 
but yeah, so I, I think it helps in, in a lot of ways. So yeah. Now you mentioned your dad did computers. Did he encourage you to do computers too? Or did yeah, he, he like, um, don't get into it, son? He actually built me my first computer when I was, gosh, not even 10. Jeez. Uh, this was back when the what computer kind was, it? was, it was a PDP-8E. Huh. It, was, it was about twice my height and did no less kidding. than my Apple Watch, you know? Like, it's just, it is what it is, but, you know, back then. And so, I, I mean, I learned how to program young. It was yeah. all a part of it. I just didn't think it would be a career track. But, but I think what I love now and, and what I think is, is perfect about technology, especially for me, is it's no longer about having to write every single line of code. Hmm. There are so many libraries. There are so many platforms. Yeah. There are so many tools. It's now, back to your point earlier, what do we do with it? Like, what's the problem we're trying to solve? What are we trying to accomplish? You can't build a company just based on, I wrote a couple lines of code and made something do something, you know? Not anymore. <laughs> you know, especially when you've got kids competing in robotics companies yeah. who could program circles around me. Though I will, I will tell you one anecdote about why uh, I am not the best programmer. Uh, when I shifted to the management track, uh, it, was, it was a couple months, actually, probably more than a couple months after I had uh, brought my team on board and my engineers actually pulled me aside and said, Kevin, will you stop coding? And I was like, okay. And they're like, they were very gentle about it. They were like, you're just not in touch with like a lot of the, you know, the best practices and stuff. But really what they were telling me is they're tired of cleaning up my code you're right? after I wrote it. So, so I, you know, Hands off, let my engineers do what I'm paying them to do. And, and they, they were damn good at it. So, yeah. you know, focus on well, the, the it other makes challenges. Sense, right. You let, let, you know, the people that are in it all the time and you have to learn to, they call it letting go of the vine sometimes, you know, let yeah. you know, delegate and elevate and let other people, you know, crush their jobs and, and rock yeah. it out there. So. Well, if you're going to hire someone, trust them to do what you hired them to do. Mm, it seems like a no brainer, but I, it, it, yeah, it isn't, no, it's, right? it's a tough one. <laughs> People don't like letting go, and I'm, I'm a little bit type A, so I, I, I like to make sure it gets done, and it gets done a certain way. So for me, it's been a little tough to, to step back and say, you handle it. This is, you know, this is generally the outcome I want. You, you make it happen. Right. Yeah, and I've found that you know, some of the people I've worked with in the past have a little bit of that like tender spot because in the past, you know, I, I, I wasn't doing that well. So now that I am, like, no, you got this. So like, you sure I got this? Like, <laughs> Is that yeah, going to come back to what? bite me later? <laughs> yeah, you got this. Are you sure? Are you going to freak out on this? No, no, you're good. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you're, you're right. You, need, you know, hire the right people, hire the best people, and then, you know, on your team and, you know, let it, let it, let it go. Stop holding it back, you know, to your point. So did I'm going to say basic. I did. I did learn basic. Me too. You know, what's funny is yeah. our paths are really, really similar. Just, you know, I'm just that much younger than you. Um, <laughs> but, I knew that was coming. Um, but <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I get for, for reminding you that I'm older than you before this right. started. Right before we start, he's like, you know, I'm older than you. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, I started on basic too. And, you know, mine was, you know, we date ourselves. So mine was an Apple IIe you know, okay. um, but still floppy disks and booting. I, I saw my, I saw my first Apple IIe in seventh grade. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah no, I, just when, after that for when me. my dad, when my dad taught me, uh, he, on the PDP 8E, we didn't have a keyboard yet. So all we had are the switches in the front. So he had to teach me how to what? convert my code to binary. Wow. I would have to set the switches insert each character and do it. And then the printer would show me if I did it right or not. Oh, geez. And I used to, I used to geek out on that. I had my eight tracks playing in the background. It was, it was pretty <laughs> awesome. Hawaiian shirt. And Love then we got, a, um, and then we got a teletype, which was like a giant typewriter that printed the ticker tape that you could feed back in. Is that the noisy the thing that's like... Chick -a -chick -a -chick -a -chick -a -chick -a yeah, no, it was like little strip tape yeah. that would punch holes in it. And then you could feed it back in and it would read it. Wow, the tape. Yeah. The tape. yeah. yeah. I, I missed the punch card days. Those were the you original. missed punch cards. Okay. I did. I did. I did them. 
too young for punch cards. <laughs> That's a good so way to say it, right? So Casey, there's, like, there's like eight okay. people out there going like, don't you say it, don't you say it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been dying to ask you since we talked yesterday, I'm a native of Nashua, New Hampshire. Right. So, so where you're based, that's where I grew up. I spent the first 18 years of my life. And then I went off to Ithaca College, upstate New York, came back to the area and ended up owning a house in, in a uh, small rural town uh, a little bit west of... Um, of Nashua just for, gosh, I sold it a couple weeks ago. Really? Like even, yeah. even you like renting it for a while? Or? We rented it for, wow. for about four years. So yeah. So like, I, I'm very much a, a New Hampshire native. Are you originally from Nashua? Yeah. Good question. Um, no, I was actually born in Virginia. Okay. And actually my dad was in the Navy at the time. And so apparently he was out at a, sh- on a ship when I was born. So you mentioned the teletypes and all that. He got a telegram saying that it was wow. a boy. You know, wow! Like it's a boy, and then they probably did this like cigars and brandy. <laughs> there's no alcohol in the I don't know, but somebody somebody had some somewhere, and uh, yeah. And so when I get, when he got back, apparently I was in like a little crib, and he's like, "Oh, this is my son," you know. So wow, that's that kind of in Virginia. Yeah, it's in Virginia. Yeah. Okay. And then we end up moving to Ohio because he moved to the Air Force, so he didn't have to be gone for like I don't right. know nine months at a time. So Air Force was a good call. So we moved to Ohio for a little bit, but then very soon after, I don't know, maybe I was four or five, New Hampshire, and then okay. New Hampshire the whole the whole time through, and uh, and now I, I I consider it it's that place that for me, and I wonder if Portland's similar, but it it's just it's that nice mix. It's near the city, but it's not in it. It's near the ocean, near the mountains. So for me, I like coming back to to New Hampshire. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. I uh, being in Portland, Oregon now, I. I get all the natural beauty. Um, I'm, you know, at a, a decent sized city and I'm less than three hours from Seattle. Nice. I don't get, I don't get the winter like you do back there. And, so and I've got to admit you have everything I, else, I'm but the winter. Point. Cause that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I got to admit I'm getting not not that I'm encouraging everyone to move to Portland. We've got a ton of people moving to Portland, but uh, no, I, it, it seriously is, just as beautiful as New England. Interesting. It's just, you know, you get the rainy season for the, the winter. You occasionally get like a snowstorm and then it's gone, you know, maybe a week later at most. And right. then that's it. Normally it's just kind of cool and rainy all winter and then hot and sunny all summer without the humidity. Interesting. Now, now, do you, is it less of the, because the joke with Washington state is that it's just, you know, all it does is rain all the time. And then someone said, oh, that's just a joke they tell people to, when they're visiting. But my parents lived there for a couple of years. And I love Mount Rainier, but you see it, you know, once every blue moon. Yeah, so, uh, so I, we, won't, we won't talk about, you know, global climate change at sure. all. Because I honestly think, you know, some of the weather patterns probably have changed. Um, even, even in all the years I commuted on the East Coast, I think that snow belt shifted and moved. So I used to leave my house in rural New Hampshire and I would have a foot of snow on the ground. I'd get to the office and there'd be two inches. And then towards the end of that cycle, before I started working from home, I would actually leave my house and there'd be very little snow on the ground and they'd be getting more the closer I got to Boston. So I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I haven't actually looked at, you know, true data, but just anecdotally, like I, I've seen that change. I, I think, I mean, we do get a lot of rain here. Like I'll I'll be the first to admit it, but I feel like it makes me appreciate the sunny days in between for real. Yeah. You know, and I would, I would much rather take, you know, a week of cloudy rainy over, you know, a week of zero degrees Fahrenheit with, you know, two feet of snow on the ground and having to shovel and drive on it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Like we like to, you know, you know, the story you're up here and you, Hey, you know, snow winter builds character but toward the end of that character building season you're like i got enough character okay and that's why you build up enough character to become a snowbird and you know (laughs) you you get old enough that you you stay up there in the nice weather and then you go down south in the winter (laughs) very tempting (laughs) first you're like what are they doing then you're like i understand what they're doing uh you know you mentioned observations one thing i've observed if i Empty my snowblower from of gasoline. You know, you kind of let it run so that it clears mm-hmm. the tubes and it doesn't, because they die over the summer if you leave it in there. 
if I prepare my snowblower for the summer, it snows afterward. If I leave the gas in there, no snow. No. So I think a lot of this might have to do with just whether or not I proactively am taking care of my, my yard equipment. I was just going to say for everybody listening, if there's <laughs> another snowstorm, you can blame Casey. You can blame. No, I'm not, I probably won't clear that out until <laughs> July. So just in case. So, so if you just have a smooth transition into spring, it's all Casey. I'm like the new groundhog, right? <laughs> I love it. Oh, man. Well, this has been great, man. This, this has been, been awesome. Fun. Thank you. So where are some of the places that people can connect with you? The the Twitter sphere, all the different places, yeah. you know, all the things. Cool. What are the, some good links for you? Your podcast too, maybe just you know, cut a little shout out on that and like some of the guests you've had would be awesome. Oh, totally. Uh, let's start with a podcast because yeah, I, yeah. I love doing it. You know, it's, it's beautiful when you get paid to have conversations with people. And- Hell Yeah. And really enjoy yourself. So uh, go to quotable.com slash podcast. You got the, the domain itself? Yeah. Quotable. Yeah. Wow. Um, a- so so quotable.com slash podcast. Yeah. You'll find links to us on iTunes, Spotify. Um, you can listen right there online. Uh, we've had a lot of great minds in sales on. And we've had, you know, like the, the episode that went live last week. Uh, last week. Wow. This week is uh, Larry Davis from Boston Scientific talking about his experiences implementing CRM and how they approach it, how they tackle it. Um, Our goal is to share the best advice for sales. So we try and stay product agnostic and and really just find what people are doing or what the thought leaders are are thinking right now and and what especially the researchers are finding and and share that out and, and really... You know, you can find articles on Quotable as well, but like I love doing the podcast, getting them on, talking about it. Um, and in terms of finding me, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's Kevin Mick, K-E-V-I-N-M-I-C. And then same thing on LinkedIn. It's, uh, you know, LinkedIn slash in Kevin Mick, K-E-V-I-N-M-I-C. Nice. Yeah, love to connect with folks. You know, the podcast, and we're definitely going to put a link in the show notes to that. CRM, it's so important you know, just like marketing automation, even more so with CRM, you, you can be given this set of tools, whether it's one of the better tool sets or one of the lighter ones, you're just trying it out. It, you really got to do it right. And so many people have either, you know, not taken the time to set it up right or inherited a tool that yeah. no one implemented. And so you know, at Cheshire, we see a lot of these people and we obviously help fix them, but man, what a really cool podcast. To, it goes, to it goes back to what you said. Yeah. Uh, earlier and that is if you haven't thought through what the strategy is and what the process is just throwing a tool at it doesn't fix anything and and i think you know i love what you're doing here and trying to get folks in and and kind of talking about what they're doing what they're seeing we do the same thing because i would much rather help people figure out that strategy or figure out the right process and then they could figure out the tools My, my job right now is not to help you figure out the tool specifically. It, it's really to help you figure out what's the best way to do this. And then yeah. the tool may be part of that. It, it may be a different tool. I don't know. But if you don't know, to your point, what it is you're trying to fix and, and how you want to approach it, what are you throwing a tool at it for? Absolutely. There it is right there. Quotable.com <laughs> slash podcast. podcast. Fix your damn CRM. Listen to <laughs> I the did not it, say that. It, and these experiences, uh, it, that's how people learn is through experiences. So oh yeah. People can oh, go yeah. to this, hear how other people are really using tools. Uh, well, it's like watching a carpenter do his thing and frame a house. He's like mind blowing, right? Like, yep. <laughs> how did you do that? Just you know, oh, just nails and lumber. You're like I know, but you really did that well. So. Yeah, people being able to go and listen to other experiences of how other people really nailed it. That's that's awesome. So cool. It. Hey, thanks again, man, for, for doing this. Yeah, have totally. To have you come back on here later on Geek Out some more. But this has been awesome. I was gonna say next trip I have to to the Northeast. Uh, I will find time and, and you and yeah. I can do it like live in person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring your mic and, and your, <laughs> your boom stand and everything. We'll set a little shop up over here. I love Make it. it happen. Love it. Cool. Awesome. 
Well, all right. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And ever listening, thanks for, thanks for coming. If you like this episode, if you learned something, if you didn't, you were sleeping, but if you did learn something, you know, share it with someone you care about. Uh, even if we don't care about, just share it. Get that information out there so people are learning and improving what they're doing. And this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show, everybody. Hey, we'll see you next time. Yeah.